Welcome to Creative Courage Chats, a search for a new understanding of creativity and problem solving. I'm Alex Raffi. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another uh, Creative Courage Chats. I'm here with Kate Stern today. So this should be very fun because she's clearly a champion of creativity. And I was told I have to talk to her. I was told. So, so, uh, so here we are. So we're, thank you for so you're, you're following orders. I am following orders, which is very smart. I always, I always do, especially when women tell me to do something, when women tell me to, I do it. <laughs> so uh, she's a contemporary art uh, curator who conceptualizes and executes large scale public art installations, as well as museum and gallery exhibits. But like I said, after doing some research on her, she's clearly a champion for creativity in many ways. So I'm looking forward to get her perspective. But you're much more than that. So you want to tell everybody a little bit more about what you Ooh, do? And, yeah. I'm much more than that. Tell me, yes. I don't even know how to respond to that. But do you mean tell you a little bit about this, what I do? or what Yeah, do? yeah just talk a little bit okay. about yourself. So I am a what's called an independent curator. That means you're not affiliated only with one association or a museum and um i came in speaking of creative courage i came in through the side door not the back door but the side door i had no background in um art training i wasn't i didn't study art history i didn't take any curatorial studies i just sort of walked in the side door um and was brainstorming with a friend who was running the uh, Zimmer Children's Museum in Los Angeles. And um, she had gotten a phone call at that time from while I was sitting there and we were talking, she was my closest friend, and got a call from a museum in, in uh, Haifa asking if they would like to show this exhibit that they had done there called Show and Tell the Art of uh, Connection where telephones had been turned into works of art. And I heard her saying, well, we don't do that sort of thing. We're an educational museum. We don't really bring exhibits. And I was in the background, and I know this is a podcast, so just imagine a woman right, twirling her, hairs in the, her hands in the air going like, stop, don't say that, don't say that. No, no, no. Like a yeah. flagging down an airplane on the runway kind of a thing. There is a video version of this that's going to be available. So uh -oh. everybody will see you do that. <laughs> I know that. I would have put on more makeup <laughs> or done something with roots. But anyway, so um, okay. I was doing that because Esther is her name. And I had been having a previous conversation where she had been originally given the largest grant in the state of California for any children's educational art program mm. for something called You Think. And you spell it, it's You Think as one word. So it looks like Youth Inc. Or you think that's good and, yeah and the Love grant it. was over it was a five-year grant and she was saying how am i gonna raise this kind of money and continue these programs we were doing because she was doing it which were out in the community and a, a teaching sort of inner city kids to foster critical thinking and all kinds of things right and as we were brainstorming about that and things that i could add to my repertoire um using my own uh natural skills that phone call comes in. So I'm doing the, the dance with my hands and she <laughs> says to the guy, may I call you back? So she said, what's up? I said, are you kidding? Say yes, do this, because they had done it in Israel as a fundraising exhibition. She said, I don't have time for this. And that's not art they're selling, they're showing it. I said, no, 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 no. We'll get people, I'll help you. I'll ask people in LA, we'll call all these artists and oh, why don't we call social activists because that goes along with what you're doing and we'll have people and we'll do our own version and you'll sell these and so she's i said it's like we're killing two birds it works for you it works for me so she says okay so boom i was a curator so the first show you kind of fell into that that's great yeah so the first show though i i i had no limit like i didn't i always say i was almost braver before I knew anything. I, I think we all are in some, on some ways. So in other words, I would pick up the phone and I would call anybody and ask them, you know, to be in this show. And as I got older, and I'll tell you more of the things where I, ha where I really started calling some very, very famous artists, I got a little more nervous about it because I knew what it meant and I knew what it took and I knew what I was asking for. But long story short, the first, the first show, 
we went all over the place. We did artists, celebrities, um, what the museum called everyday heroes, and social activists. And in the first show, I had a crazy number, 189 participants. We then narrowed it down to 75 wow. artists and activists per show. We raised a lot of money. And even Robert Rauschenberg made the final piece he made before he died, he did for one of my shows oh, wow. for, the, for the Zimmer Museum. But the biggest thrill for me was finding the social activists. Um, that was when I, when I have certain people who are still very much in my life, and one, in fact, I've talked to twice this week who I discovered through that and read about, because I would do all these research looking for activists. Those are the people that really blew me away. But I would say I got my art education, you know, on the job. And, um, and it does haunt me from time to time because I, most curators have a, a great knowledge of art history. I don't. Or, or arts writers and when that comes up and it comes into play in certain things like my last museum show it's just more of a struggle for me because I know I can make a dynamite looking exhibition and I know I can find artists that will thrill people but I don't necessarily know all the other things that people that other curators do so I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of always faced with my vulnerability and challenges in, in those areas. Yeah, but it doesn't seem to stop you though. It doesn't stop me, but it, it, it stops me a little more. I'm a little more hesitant than I used to. Last year was a good year for me. So it was good for my, um, I don't want to say e probably ego, but it was good for my sense of self because I had a few down uh, years of not doing projects. And when, when you're out of it for that long, you've probably had, maybe, I hope you haven't had this experience you start to not feel like you're a part of something anymore. And mm -hmm. I don't mean like being a part of the group, being a part of the being in, I mean, not getting to use that create that creative process and see it come to fruition. Well, last, this, the, the, this entire project of mine is, 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 okay. is about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, is, is trying to find a way to contribute to the world in some way by sharing the creative perceptions of other people and ideas of other people and, and doing that stuff. Because, yeah, I, I, when I'm not working on something, I kind of feel like I'm dying. <laughs> yes. It's, okay, so you get it. Yeah, you, you've uh, kind of... Uh, been surrounded by creativity your entire life, even as a child. Yes. Um, can you can you t tell everybody a little bit about that? I mean, because sure. you're connected to one of my favorite favorite shows. Which one? Is Get Smart. I, yes. I, I, I so love that show. Well, I, I, I always <laughs> say I grew up on that set because <laughs> that the set where I could go yeah. visit and play. So okay, so my father's name was Leonard Stern, AKA the greatest guy ever in the entire <laughs> world. Yeah. Um, and my dad was a writer, a television writer, a comedy writer and a producer and occasionally also a director, but also truly one of the all time great human beings in every, 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 you know, mm -hmm. definition of the word. So, um, so when I was little, he had shows before that when I was little, but they were shorter run or not as well known. And I can't remember how, I think Get Smart came on in maybe 64, 65. I don't quite remember the year. I was born in 59. So however old I was, five, six, six. And it was on for, you know, many, many years, many seasons. So um, a typical summer afternoon for me would be to go to the set and hang out with dad on the set and play in the cone of silence with um, Ed Platt, <laughs> so who sweet. was the person I just really adored on the show. He seemed like a very sweet man. He was the sweetest man. And I don't know why I thought it was funny every time, but we would get in the cone of silence. He would say to my dad, Leonard, I, I, if, if that was the set, uh, Kate, Kate and I are gonna step in the cone of silence. And I could sometimes hear my dad go, oh, Ed, we gotta move on. Like we gotta, and he'd go, Leonard, and then he'd go, oh, okay. <laughs> and then boom, the co you know, I would go yeah. on, I would sit, and he would sit, and all he would say was things like, how are you? <laughs> and I would go, what? 
Oh, that's so you great. Go, How are you? <laughs> and I thought it was hysterical. Even you're laughing. And I thought it was, and then he'd say things like, how's school? And I go, what? And I don't know why I thought that was so funny. <laughs> well, you were doing the bit. That's the I bit. I was doing the bit. <laughs> <laughs> but so I had a real affinity oh, for him. Wow. And then um, Barbara Feldon was great. She took yeah. us, she, her, she was dating one of the producers, a man named Bert Nodella. And Bert Nodella had a, a boat. And I forget who else had a boat, but they would go on races and my brother would go, let's say Michael would go with Barbara and I would go with Bert or, or vice versa. And they would do like these sailing races to Catalina and, and invite us to go. So, and, and um, Dom, I didn't know as well as the others, though I, I did know his, his daughters, mm -hmm. um, Cecily and Stacy. Um, but, and, and then I was um, Jaime, who I adored. And the person I really had my own relationship with well, well, well into adulthood was Bernie Capel, uh, who played, who was the head of chaos. Yeah. So Bernie's my bud. And, um, he was amazing. He, he's still uh, alive, uh, but he's, he was just so great. So I just had, so, so yes. Yeah, so my father was a television writer and, sure. um, and also created something that was very well known amongst kids and still is called Mad Libs. Oh Yeah. So when I was a kid, Mad Libs were coming out and everybody played it on road trips. And now oh, they yeah. use it. <laughs> it's like every road trip I yeah, had it. And now they use it in school. And mm. so, you know, I'd bring them as presents. And so, because dad and his best friend created uh, Mad Libs when they were, it's a sweet story. They were sitting, they were both writers, Roger Price, and they were sitting together working on something that they weren't working on together. They just happened to be in the same space together. And one of them, I don't remember who said to the other, I just, I can't, I'm so struggling for a word, for a good uh, adjective to describe. And the other one, let's say dad said, don't tell me. And he said, don't tell you. He goes, yeah, just, oh, you want to need an adjective? Okay, bulbous. And then they both laughed because it had <laughs> nothing to do with whatever was yeah. the next part of the sentence. Yeah. Yeah. And they thought, oh, this is funny. So yeah. they started doing that and they played it with friends and it was always so funny. And they thought, we got to publish these. Yeah. And so they published them themselves and they knocked on doors in the apartment buildings, like selling, you know, giving them away, then selling them. And that was the beginning of what became their company called Feister and Sloan. And, you know, that went on. So that's my dad's side. Then my mother. You know, I just, I, I, I re doing Mad Libs in the car, there's such fond memories of laughing so hard that you couldn't breathe because, it, and, and you, what was great about it yeah. is you're not laughing at something someone did. You're laughing at what you did. Right, you're so proud of yourself for saying Yeah, you're laughter. like, you're like, I'm hilarious. Right, like I said fart and everybody's laughing. Yeah. But when it started getting into those words. I'm right? a comic genius. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who knew green was so funny? Exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. That's, that's well, amazing. Well, that's I want to so shout out to dad because I would say his most beloved show was probably The Honeymooners. Oh so my dad, goodness. So dad yeah. wrote The Honeymooners. Yes. Right, <laughs> right. Some other writers, but. Um, okay, so mom. Mom <laughs> is, is and was an actress and a sculptor. And as of maybe three years ago, and my mom just turned 96 last Friday, She's also a writer. She had her memoirs published. Oh. But she was always sculpting since I was maybe, um, I don't know, seven, eight. She was just looking for something creative. She'd done a lot of uh, theater, a lot of stage work in New York. And suddenly she was, they, they moved here because dad had work here. And she had two, my brother and I are only a year apart. So we were one and two or one and a half and two and a half and we moved here and suddenly you know however many years into it she was like I gotta do something and somebody said why don't you take a sculpting class and she said I'm not interested in in sculpting and they said she said how do you know you never tried it so right. she went to a class and she fell madly in love with it and that's like a 30-year career of sculpting however she sculpted for herself so what I mean by that is she never thought to show the work the house was filled with incredible sculptures some she made an award for something but this last january uh my one of my closest friends and i curated a show for my mom and she had her first big solo with 20 some odd pieces oh that's so fantastic and it was that's beautiful great. and it was 
a, a highlight for her to see them on pedestals in a big gallery. And so- I really, I'm sorry about the abstractness of this question, but I'm gonna throw it to you. No, no, her. please. What, 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 why? Because I think this is an important question for me because I feel like the world doesn't get it, especially sometimes in schools and stuff. Why is art important? Why is art important? <sighs> <laughs> I told you. <laughs> no, I'm doing that because I think there's so much written about, and I don't know again that I can speak the language, okay? I, because I am that girl that goes, ooh, pretty. So, but I think, do, do you mean necessarily fine art or can it be all arts? The arts or art as in painting, sculpture? I, I guess, I guess I'm talking, I'm talking about See, I don't want to limit it I, because, because like- Okay, well, just, well, let's because, start with art. You, 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 I don't you, know. Okay. Let me say for me. Let me say first just for me. Mm -hmm. Because again, remember, I didn't, I wasn't a young girl going, oh, I want to have a career in, in art or the arts. I wasn't. I wanted to be two things. I wanted to be an actress or what's called a <laughs> delphinologist, somebody who studies dolphins. You just said, okay, I don't want a career in the arts. I just wanted no. to be an actress. <laughs> I meant, I, meant in art. I meant in fine art. I didn't okay. want to be um, right. a curator or a painter. I, didn't, I never thought about any of that stuff. What's I, the other I mean, thing? What's the other thing? Okay. Uh, it's called, or I thought it was called at the time, a delphinologist. It's someone who works and studies dolphins. Oh, dolphins. Okay. And I loved science and I was horrible in math. So that wasn't going to happen. But um, so again, I came into art not from that place of saying, of having that of uh, that incredible drawn emotion towards it, so it it, it grew on me, I think. But be, but what it, I feel inside is, I give you the best this the best example I can. This is what's coming to my mind right now. At the end of that period where I told you everything stopped in a five day period, I knew that I was going to feel depressed and that it would be depressing for a while because I didn't know what my next job was for the first time in 10 years or 12 years. And I knew that I wouldn't visually be able to see anything that I had worked on or share it with anybody. And I just knew it would be such a letdown. And so I wanted to do something for myself that felt the word I kept getting was adventurous. I wanted to do something that made me feel um, excited, proud, that would, would, would stimulate me in a certain way. And I didn't really want to be home, you know? So I thought, okay, I've never driven around the country and I've always wanted to. And right now I don't have to show up anywhere. My dog who had lived to be 18 had passed away. I wasn't in a relationship. I thought, okay, when am I, I was 56 years old. I thought, when am I going to have this kind of freedom? And what would I want to do? And here's what I wanted to do. And it, and it answers for me why that is so important. I wanted to drive around the country and I wanted to navigate the entire country through art, mm. through art and animals, because those are my two greatest loves. So I went, I didn't make it to every museum, of course, in America, but I spent what was going to be one month I spent five months and four days on the road by myself driving around America. And I navigated every stop, every state, every city by what museum or what sculpture garden or what work of art I wanted to go see. And then I would look up, there were certain animal sanctuaries I wanted to go to. And, you know, if I was driving and it said prairie dogs, 18 miles, you know, eh, I turned the car and I went to kiss some prairie dogs. So I couldn't pass a cow or a horse without getting out of the car. And, sure. and, and wild animals, thank God, come up to me. And I mean wild animals come up to me. And we have full-on physical touching, kissing exchanges. So I'm fortunate this way. But so I, and this time was hands down, nothing will ever come close. The greatest time of my life. Now I did also go see some people. Um, so I can't say I spent five months alone, but I spent four months alone, you know, all alone. And so to, to me, the beauty, the combination of 
seeing nature, why I particularly love, let's say, sculpture gardens, like Storm King, which is up in the Hudson River Valley and, mm -hmm. um, in upstate New York, to see these massive sculptures in this beautiful, you know, natural setting is such a high, and I'm not somebody who gets high or ever liked getting high. I don't even drink. I've never had a beer. And it's not because I'm Mormon. It's because beer smells bad. Sure. Um, wine gives me a headache. I mean, I'm just like, that's the high for me. Kissing animals, looking at um, art, if I love the art, if I love the piece, it's, it's where I feel joy and it's where I start to think and maybe analyze creativity is by when I look at something and that's what I loved so much about my last museum show which was called dress rehearsal and though it expanded the original concept was just was dresses made out of non-traditional materials which include mm -hmm. everything from food to I vote I voted by the way for that oh you there. voted for her yes I did vote fabulous. yeah that it was very nice woman. Yeah. thank you yeah. um and that wasn't in my show because I found that afterwards yeah but yeah. there's some pieces in in dress rehearsal which um, if anybody wants to they can go to my website at yes. katesburnprojects.com and go to museums and look at some of the work in dress rehearsal it will blow you away right. and so when I look at uh, a, a, something that is creative and I respond more to three-dimensional work than paintings myself mm -hmm. though there are some paintings that will completely blow me away but I think personally I get more excited stimulated um, by more of a mixed media or but for me when I can see someone's creativity and then their skill on top of it or how far their mind went there's an artist, Melissa Meyer, who's in, my, in that show, and we're working on a solo show for her right now. Her mind, it, there's no one like it. There's no one for me that I, I just go, how, how did you think of, you know, making a dress, a headdress and shoes out of sea sponges, and they're that elegant, or eggshells, and they're that... I mean, you got to see this stuff to fully appreciate what I'm saying, but that's the part of art for me. So why do we need it? Not everybody has the same reaction, but for those who do, I think it shows you, it shows you how far the mind can go. Because if you're reading, if it's a book, you're reading someone's words and that can, and you'll feel that experience and you'll go where they want you to go or a film, they go, you go where they're leading you to. I think in art, you're left, in fine art, you're left a lot more to the imagination on top of what they've, they've made for you to see. But for me, it's just to see somebody's, I'm blown away by people's creativity. I mean, there's nothing more exciting for me than, 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 um, Kissing a dog on the tip of the nose. Those two things are yeah. just hey, Dogs are great. Well, I you mean, know, it's not, it doesn't get better. I like the way you explain things. I, I enjoy it. I, I, I and, hope and, I answered your question because no, I often go well, all, all, all over the place. No, I know, but it took me somewhere. See, see, I, I, I rode this boat with you, you know, and, and okay, you, good. you're headed in a direction. But, it, but I was taking something with me, what you were saying. And I kind of okay, think, yeah. it, you, know, you know, between people and humans, the most precious thing is, is what we do for each other, right? The preciousness yeah. in humanity is when yeah. we're working for each other and helping each other. And I think that that's something that's, that what I got out of it is you were searching for, you know, learning about yourself in your voyage. And in turn, you're doing it through other people's works that they've been willing to share with the world as well. Because an artist, what they're doing is they're sharing who they are in, in many ways in, through their art, but they're not explaining what it is. So then you can feel that experience and decide what it is, but it's always mingles with who you are. So it's kind of beautiful. It's kind of like the way two people connecting that have never met before. They're not right. maybe from, from even different times. You know, the person could be long gone, but you're right. able to mingle with that essence of that person for some reason. And I think that that's, that's you know, is so incredibly important. Everybody, everybody, I, you know, 
I was in the Big Brothers Big Sisters program, and and I have the and I, and I was uh, my little, who I knew was ten, is now he's thirty six and he's a grown man. Uh, I love it. And, and he came by yesterday, and we hung out in the backyard, and we're talking, and we talked about moments of discovery, where you know moments in life that when you discover something and it sets you on a path, it's important, right? Yes. And you've had many of those clearly where you've had an experience that set you on a path and then you ended up going in a certain direction. And um, everybody does, but not many people know what they are. And I think that accumulation of the understanding those moments helps you understand who you are better because we don't know. We don't really know. You know, my best friend said something to me before the drive and, it, and mm -hmm. I didn't know what he meant. And until I got to Maine, which, you know, is as far as you can go oh, yeah. before you go to Nova I Scotia. Love I love Maine. It was my favorite state. Yeah. So my best friend said to me, and he'd done many, 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 many road trips. And he said, you will meet yourself mm -hmm. on this road or on this journey. And I said, I don't really know what that means. He said, you will meet yourself. And I said, I know myself so well. And he said, no, you will meet yourself. And we talked a lot during the trip. When I got to Maine, I got some little ding, ding, ding went off in my head because I, I guess because I had reached the other side of the country, you know, as, unless I was going to go into Canada, I was in the top of, you know, the northern top of me. And I thought, but I thought about it and it was until you've spent that kind of time alone with yourself. Um, and I mean, the luxury of it is crazy because especially in a car you know it, it, otherwise if there was somebody else you you have to converse you have to argue you know do you like the same kind of music what if i have to go to the bathroom 200 times and you only have to go four you know there's there's all that right and it it's the i could do what i wanted to do when i wanted to do it and if i wanted to kiss you know 10 horses in two hours nobody was going to stop me and if i wanted to spend three days returning to the same museum, um, I could, but I, there was something about spending that time alone with my thoughts and, you know, eating every meal alone and you just, and navigating a country. I'm dyslexic. I have a worse sense of direction you could ever imagine. I don't even have, didn't even have a regular GPS in the car. I had my phone and my phone would go out sometimes. So, you know, I'd be like, I have no idea where I am. You know, hopefully I make it out uh, before dark or whatever. But um, the, that feeling, uh, I never knew myself the way I knew myself then. And, no. and it's only when I tell it to people and they say something like, you're so brave. And I remember thinking brave, but now I go, oh, I guess that was brave. You know, I wasn't thinking that in the time, but I guess it's brave to some people that seems brave. Um, to me, it was just exciting, but um, the art was so stimulating. I can't tell you. And I look at the photos over and over and over again, and I get re-stimulated by looking at what I saw. I think if I was to title this talk, I, I would capitalize the word courage through the whole thing because I, I, oh. I, I feel like you, uh, I, I imagine that when you're curating, your goal is to have people experience the artwork the way you experienced the artwork on your trip. You want people. Oh, to, I've never thought about that. I'll bet, I'll bet that that's a huge motivator for you. And I think that would makes you a pretty great curator because you know, if that's if that's your goal, and you're, who cares about your knowledge of art history? If you, because because most of the time you're not there to talk to the people that are consuming the art, but if the intent is you want them to take a bite out of life in a sense for a moment and just taste it, you know, and the texture of it and everything, and then take it in and swallow it, and now it becomes part of who you are, you know. And I think that's kind of what you're supposed to do. And a lot of people keep themselves for whatever reason from exploring and expressing themselves or, or just diving into things because the, the act of they act like they're literally jumping into fire when they're not they're trying something that's not going to burn you but they, they you they know fear. i wish i wish and, and i'm sure many 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 people do but for the for those of for those who have never tried any form of artistic endeavor on their own mm -hmm. i would hope 
for themselves because A, not only does it activate a whole other side of your brain, but it's like what we were talking about. You don't know what you can do till you do it, right? right. And some things are instinctual. If sure, somebody, a sculptor uh, sits down and some has no training and just makes things from nothing and others learn certain things. But I have a feeling it puts everybody in touch with a side of themselves they might not touch if what well, you could be baking it could be whatever you do that feels creative especially for people that aren't create that will say i am not creative at all those are the ones i want to say just do it try something just try something because i want you to feel after you get past the frustration or the being hard on yourself like this is not what i'm good at or whatever to feel that breakthrough you mm -hmm. know of because it's not the same as learning. It's not, I'm not talking about taking the knowledge in. I'm talking about finding what's inside of you that you don't even know is there and then seeing what comes out and you get to share what comes out with whoever will look at it or wants to see it. Or even if it's, you're just making, you're making somebody laugh. You get to see them laugh. You know, you get to hear them laugh. You, you, you know, where you tap into these parts of yourself but that are, um, the laugh was like a sidebar, but I was just thinking about that. My brain goes, da ding, da ding, da ding. No, that's, that's great. That was actually, I talk about on this, I don't know if you've seen my-, my, my, well, my uh, One or two so far. Yeah, where I talk about rewind moments. And oh, right, yeah. That was my rewind moment for, the sh for this, because where, where you were talking, what you're talking about, the advice you were just now giving, I think is important. I think it's important for people to hear that. Well, kind of, you know. I think, you know, I, I, I noticed something once, you'll appreciate this. And in the brief time we talked on the phone, I don't know if I told you this, but at one time I remember, I don't know how I figured it out. It must have either been friends of my parents or I was at a doctor's office. Somehow I discovered, let's say three or four doctors that I knew, surgeons or something, also played an instrument. And I was fascinated. I remember thinking, oh, that's interesting. Like the first time it was just, oh, I had no idea so-and-so was so good on the piano. So I don't know how I knew this. Maybe they were friends, like I said, of the family, and suddenly they sat down and they played. And I started to ask, anytime I went to a doctor's office or the dentist or anything, I'd say, do you play an instrument? And I'd say three out of five will say yes. And I started thinking, okay, this is real and, and good. Like they're profit, you know, and I thought, oh, okay, surgeons, they're really good with their hands. Right. And so that would make you dexterous in terms of maybe on uh, 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 I mean, a brass and, you know, uh, yeah, having yeah. a hard time remembering, not a wind, whatever, whatever those things are called, like a truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, having instruments. a senior moment um, or piano or anything. Yeah, I, yeah. And I started, I'd say that to people and then they would say to me, you know, I asked and three of my doctors all play. And I thought, okay, there's that side of the brain that, that, there's something about the, because believe me, you also have to be, I imagine, incredibly creative to be a surgeon at this, you know, besides mm -hmm. the knowledge, I'm assuming there's a, especially the ones that create, a, 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 what am I trying to say? You know, find a procedure, discover sure. something. Discover something, yeah. So I think within all of us, there might, there is some probably true level of, doesn't even have to be good. That's the problem is we all want to be good at what we do. But just to have the experience of making something mm -hmm. yeah. or painting something. And you're I mean, tapping you into you're, you're tapping into a lot of things in my book. I need to just send you my book because please send me your book. I will send me my book. I'm the lowest reader. I'm dyslexic. No, and it's it'll fine. take me three and a half years to read your book, but I will read it, you know, a page a month. It's all right. No, but 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 it's true because I, that's the thing. That's my 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 takeaway, or my, the one thing I want people to take away when they think of creativity. That it's not just about art. Creativity is basically uh, this is what it is. This is how I describe it to people. I take you take a bird, and you take a horse, and you put them together, and you make a Pegasus. Creativity is taking two things that don't seem the same, and you put them together, and you make something brand new. Right? right. What is that? That's problem solving right? Creativity is problem solving. Creativity is taking your concepts and your ideas and then manifesting into to something new. And doctors, 
they're solving a lot of problems. <laughs> the all they do is analyze this and this. How do we find a solution to kind of go? So there is no difference. There is no difference between an artist and a scientist or an artist and a lawyer or, or a, an artist and anyone else that, because, and that's the thing when people say they're not creative. Are they the same side of the brain or is that right No, brain I think brain? that's just, the, it's the same part of the brain that, that, that comes up with, with that is, 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 where it, is where it comes from. And I, and I, I honestly believe that. I, I believe that there is, the thing is that, this is what frustrates me, is that the nice thing about art is that it's almost like exercise, of, in, especially in school, and when I'm talking in terms of school. If they keep okay. the arts in schools, it doesn't matter what the arts is, it, it exercises your mind and it helps people start to, to understand how they think. So that when they go into history class or go into math class, they're, they're more in tune and they're able to do it. There's a lot more to art than pen and ink and watercolors. You're but getting some confidence. it's also for kids, it's their playtime. And when you yeah. take that away from them, and you, like I was really, uh, school was really hard for me. I mean, I have several learning disabilities. It was just really hard for me to focus. Mm -hmm. Unless I have, I I have ADHD. I'm saying I'm ADHD and dyslexia. <laughs> yeah. So, and OCD, but that's another conversation. So, it was, but I mean, if I was interested in it, like I liked science, so I could concentrate there. Yeah. But art for the kids is play. Yeah. It's, it doesn't have anything serious at, and, and unless, until you're a certain age and you might want to look at it from another way. It's, it's how you find yourself of play. You know, playing on a playground is playing with others. Making art is also something you can do by yourself or you build things together. Right. But it, it's so many skills, but it's also where they get to have fun. And when they take that away and make it less important, believe me, like when was the last time you used beyond basic math? I mean, I never have to, thank I'll God. Try. But it's right. like, but I never have to. So, and yet they took, they, they'll, they'll take away art before they'll take away, I'm not saying you should take away math. I'm saying it's considered less important. It's considered, you know, frivolous, more right. frivolous. I have an anecdote real quick when I'm sharing yeah. with you. I think I've shared it before, but uh, I, I sometimes go into my local uh, schools and, and I get invited to schools and I do this program. It's called Creative Courage, but it's Creative Courage for Kids. And what I do uh -huh. is I, I, I show them how to turn an A into something or a B into a duck or a, a you know, oh, a, a number two into a snake. Like an alphabet. Right. And, an and, alphabet. And, I, and I have them start with numbers or letters. And then I and then and then I let them come up with their own designs, and I, I and I do it. So it's just a way of them trying to look at things a little differently, and it actually gives me the the opportunity once they think I'm super cool because I can draw, where I can be an outside person who can then support the teachers and support school and encourage them to 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 have a little more courage about their education and kind of go forward. So I I utilize that time to go ahead and do that. And what happens is a lot of times what happens is I'll do this thing, and they'll be. I'll notice that there'll be one kid usually or two kids that are really prolific and, and intense and they're really sitting there and they're drawing a tons of drawings and they're super focused and their, their heads are exploding with so much creativity. Now right. I have stacks of drawings that the kids have sent me uh, of, of telling um, letters where they say, that. I've never drawn so well in my life. Thank you, Mr. Raffi and stuff. So I I've done these. And then I always ask whenever I see a kid like that, I ask the teacher, what's that, what's, what's that student like? And majority of the time, that's my worst student. That's the one that's the bully. That's the one the kids are scared of. That's the one that's the mean kid. And I have this feeling that these kids early on have such a hunger for, for stimulation and they're not getting it from something yeah. that's curious to them that they use it by lashing out, by breaking something. Yeah. And they get that satisfaction by doing something bad when they could actually get it from learning how to play drums or learning how to sing, or learning how to paint something. And I think they're slipping through the cracks. These kids are slipping through the cracks because when they start off and they get told that they're bad, and that's all they're doing, what they were was just kids that were hungry for something to, to stimulate them, which could be the arts. And if we, we let them pass us, and then they go into high school, it's too late. It's too late right. because they've had an entire youth of being told they're bad. And then that, I, I actually think art saves lives. I think that people like you that do what you do and people that are artists and people that are creatives and people that are just always diving into this, the most important thing that we can do is we can talk to 
other people and share some of our passions with them so that they get encouraged. We have no idea the impact we're going to have on the world unless we talk to each other, you know? Exactly. Anyway. Exactly. That, I, how, well, can I turn this around and ask you a question? Oh. How did, what got you, what got you on this path? What got you so interested in um, how the creative process you know, Do you know Tom Dowling? Do I know what? Tom Dowling, the artist, Tom Dowling. Yeah. Yeah, Tom, I was, I was a student of his. And, oh, uh, that's why right. you told me that, I forgot. Yeah, I was a student of his. And he, uh, and, and, and that opened a door I didn't realize was opened. He opened a door that, that kind of, and I didn't realize it at the time, but he gave me permission to explore and have confidence in my creativity. Cause I was, I was very much a shy kid and, and everything. But, but then I realized, you know, I have a little bit of a superpower, I, you know, I, anyway, it's a long story. I don't want to go in cause this isn't about me, but tell me another time. I'll tell you I'm another very time. Interested. But, okay. but, but yeah, eventually, eventually I, I, I did discover that I have an idea of, I was more curious about the creative process actually even more so than creating the art. And so I kind right. of dove into it. I get that. And, and because I actually saw it as a solution to a lot of problems if people started to explore it. So this is my way of giving back. You are contributing to my personal goal to <laughs> give back to the world in some way. So hearing your story will hopefully inspire some young, young woman or young man to maybe take the steps and maybe go on a, on a trip around the country. Well, maybe if I kiss, could say- if Kiss I could some animals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I could tell, you know, if I, I always say if I could, if I could inspire people, that, that would, that would be the thing I, you know, most people can't pull off five months, but I, the, the comment I kept getting, I got the same comment everywhere I went. I got, aren't you afraid? Or either how brave, you know, you're so brave, or aren't you afraid? And I remember at a certain point, I think I was in like Rhode Island, and I said, you know, well, I wasn't until everybody keeps asking me, aren't I afraid? Right. You know, and now I'm like, what am I supposed to be? You know, and then I go, well, you know, you're a woman and you're traveling alone. Oh yeah. And I did my head beforehand. It just didn't, or they'd say, which is the part I loved and which I'm responding to now, not to those people, but to anybody who's listening to this. The other thing they said was, and this, I'm talking about women mostly and women, you know, that were maybe in my age group, older mm -hmm. or somewhat younger. So let's go at least, you know, 50 to 70 something. They'd say, oh, I always wanted to do that. And so I'd say, okay, I'm assuming you couldn't do that because you had obligations that stopped you from doing that. Um, or financial, or you were raising a family, or you couldn't leave your job, whatever it was, somehow my life worked out that all these things had ended at once. I had money in the bank. I sublet my place or I couldn't have done it. And the person kept saying, I'll stay longer if you want to keep going. And so, you know, but I would have kept going for a year, but I ran out of money and I was pooped. But I would have kept going if I could have. But I would say to those people, and I said to people the whole year afterwards in my conversations, listen, there's something that you love, whether you love quilting, or folk dancing, or golf, or uh, animals. There's something that you love. Mm -hmm. Don't fly there. Or fly somewhere, get in a car, so you have long hours by yourself. Get in a car, if it's five days, if it's two weeks, go do that thing that you wouldn't do because if you were going on vacation, instead you're gonna go see your kids somewhere else or your favorite cousin, or you're gonna do something, something. Do the thing that is in whatever, whatever that is. I love wine. Okay, don't drive to Northern California. Drive to, get on a plane, go to Ithaca, New York and go to the wine, you know, or something that makes you feel like you took yourself on some outside of your comfort zone and you get to have that experience and surrounded by something that you love. Like, thank God I love long. I mean, I don't, when I say I love long drives, I'm good for three hours and I'm done. But I mean, okay, I'll drive three hours a day a long drive for three, three months. Right. My most creative times always, all my life, they came hiking or walking alone. Yeah. 
because that's when my brain processes everything. I can't be home with all my stuff around me. I've got to be kind of for me in nature, but yeah. somewhere. And then I'm, I'm like, oh, 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 just all these things yeah. start popping and my brain's on fire. I have heard some, I, I heard it, I don't remember where I heard it, but I heard an artist say one time that the biggest obstacle to, to creativity isn't fear, it's being interrupted. <laughs> oh, that's, you know what? That's so darn true. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, I, I, um, we could talk. I feel like you and I could talk for as long as your drive's on. I think that we could, we could. Oh yeah, we could do five months together on the road. By the way, one of my favorite lines my funny dad ever said to me, Yeah. I always talked a lot. And the question like, how was school or what did you do today? Let's say, you know, my brother would go, fine. I would be like, bah, 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 and then so and so, you know, the whole thing. So my father used to say at dinner, he would do this. He'd say, pardon me. Is there an intermission before the second act? Because I'd like to use the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would say, uh. oh, have I been talking a lot? He'd say, since we sat down. And I'd be like, sorry. But he was so sweet about it yeah. that I always would like, let, pardon me. Do you have anything that you're currently working on that you want to share with anybody and, and maybe or links and things like that? Mm -hmm. I am working with the artist I mentioned, Melissa Meyer, for my last show, and they, they used one of Melissa's pieces on it. Okay, this dress. Oh my goodness! This is a dress and a headdress, and there were shoes, but it is made out of sea sponges she found in the ocean. Oh my goodness! Look at that! All right. Well, hey, okay. again, thank you. The best. Thank you. <laughs> this is very fun. Thank you, Alex. All right. Talk to you again. Talk to you Take soon. Take care.